With that, I want to get started and introduce you to two of our panelists. First up is Ms. Robin Andrasek. She brings more than 26 years of air quality experience, and she has assisted clients in both the industrial and utilities arenas throughout the United States. She has solidified herself as a valuable resource throughout the air quality permitting process for a multitude of clients. Her specialties include PSD netting, routine maintenance, and dispersion modeling. Robin is a licensed professional engineer in 10 states. She is a prolific writer and is frequently requested speaker on a variety of permitting and engineering topics. And our second panelist is Brandon Kilpatrick, who brings nearly 10 years of air quality monitoring experience. Brandon's experience includes managing benzene fence line monitoring programs for multiple clients, cooling tower emission testing, continuous emission monitoring systems, the design and installation of weather stations, and audits of monitoring instruments. He has trained clients on sulfur dioxide sampling and has also provided turnkey services for ambient air monitoring trailers. He has also provided technical oversight for LDAR monitoring operations. So now that you know a little background about both of our panelists, I'm going to turn the floor over to Robin to give you an overview of the proposed provisions. Well, thank you very much for attending and let's dig right into the regulation. These regulations are a family of interrelated rules that deal with the chemical plants. And I'm going to assume that everyone in the audience knows what I say, what I mean when I say sock me Han. And so I'm going to gear this a little bit towards the more sophisticated uh, chemical plant uh, industry professional. The interrelationship of these regulations requires that any update is going to affect several regulations, not just one. By updating these regulations, EPA has a goal to make a meaningful reduction in some of the pollutants that are of more concern when we um, get them into the air. Looking next at the chemicals that these rules specifically address, the triggering chemicals are um, ethylene oxide, fluoroprene, benzene, 1,3-butadiene, ethylene dichloride, and vinyl chloride. What's interesting here is the way that the draft rule is written is that you either use, produce, store, or emit any of these chemicals in any amount you are triggered into these revised regulations. The draft rule as written does not include any minimum threshold. This is one of the things that I'll be looking for when the final rule comes out as that is a meaningful comment that many people have made about the regulation. Looking then at the rule changes, again, a complicated set of different regulations that are related and some of the changes that we're not going to talk about today involve flares, dioxin furons, ethylene oxide, and specifically quite a bit on startup shutdown and malfunction, which we all know has become a more studied aspect of a plant's operations. What we are going to discuss in detail today is the new requirements for fence line monitoring. And along with that monitoring, how those results are then reported to EPA, and then EPA provides them to the public in a manner that is extremely easy for a non-technically savvy person to gather that information. This follows a lot of other regulations that EPA has issued where this movement towards public transparency is definitely increasing. The quarterly reporting that is required and then the need to do a root cause analysis and corrective action plan when the model monitoring shows a significant impact. Looking at the map of where the facilities are located that would be subject to these changes, we quickly see clusters in Louisiana 
and in Texas, which I'm assuming uh, represents some of the plants of people in our audience today. The action levels are when the monitoring shows an annual rolling concentration above these values, then an action plan is needed to reduce the emission, the impacts by addressing what the sources are. We have very carefully put these down as you'll see with one significant digit. The rule is very explicit that it is to one significant digit. The two week values are then rolled up into the quarterly reporting, which goes into the annual um, averages, which are then compared to these. Looking at the timeline of this regulation, it was proposed this year with an extended public comment period. And then next year, we're going to see that there is a hard deadline. There is a consent decree that EPA is under to issue these revisions by March 29th of next year. I am not a lawyer. I do not know if there's any flexibility there. I assume it is not. So that is what I'm looking to see as the drop dead date for when the revised regulations, the final regulations will be issued. Fence line monitoring in the draft rule is required one year after the rule promulgation. For planning purposes, as of right now, assume that that is March 29th of 2025. EPA estimated the costs of this compliance, and I have presented this for you here with a bit of explanation. Specifically, these costs are where it shows 35 facilities impacted, that's the cost over 35 facilities. So you can divide that by 35 to get what EPA thinks the cost will be for each facility. However, EPA has not included lab fees or any sort of supply demand issues that might happen with a new program suddenly taking up a lot of the inventory of canisters that are available throughout the country at the different labs. These costs should be taken as a minimum impact to you and an order of magnitude. During the public comment period, there were a lot of really meaningful comments. Any of us who have read public comments know that they're broken into people complaining about the rule very emotionally, EPA often discards those. Then you get very substantive comments from people who will be impacted. The public comments that I really focused on reading for this rule were from the laboratories that made comments. For example, it is required to do sampling every five days, but the labs are saying they think that's going to cause some turnaround issues. What is meant by a secure location? Moving the canisters could disturb wetlands. There's some issues with the actual methods that are used, 327, for example, that Brandon is going to get into. But in general, the labs were concerned with being able to set up the canisters, collect the samples, turn around the results, redeploy the samples, and blank and re-clean clean them in a way that keeps the inventory, um, prevents inventory issues for the different companies that are being um, required to implement these. You may be saying to yourself, well, what about the refinery? They had to do some modeling already. And I looked at the refinery rule and the comments that were made there. And we see on the next slide that the public comment period during the refinery rule draft did 
facilitate EPA changing some things in the final refinery rule. We can kind of peer into this and wonder if EPA will take some similar comments to heart for the Saki Han changes. One of the things that really confuses me though is the refinery rule was proposed at three years after promulgation of the rule one has to start monitoring. That was changed to two years. The Sakmi Han rule is one year. I don't know exactly why EPA felt that it could be turned around faster or if that is going to be something to address in the final rule. You'll notice that EPA proposed the Sakmi Han rule as quarterly monitoring. Um, the refinery rule started off semi-annually and went to quarterly. The monitor placement from um, industry experience that was gained from the refinery rule has been applied into how this rule is. And it's clear that monitors do not need to be placed exactly on the property boundary, which does give a little bit of leeway where property boundaries are affected, for example, by wetlands, which one of the commenters talked about. An EPA for the refinery rule made it clear that they think 45 days following the end of each quarter is sufficient for a facility to do the data quality analysis that's needed before the information is reported. 45 days is pretty tight and will require dedicated staff to make sure that that information is correct before it goes up. Looking even more closely at the refinery rule, I went to the website where the refinery rules um, public data is put and I randomly picked a facility. And this is the facility that I picked. And I bring this to your attention because if you're not familiar with how EPA is going to present this data to the public that you'll be soon monitoring at your facilities, you can expect something similar to this, something very graphic, um, going back to the image, something very graphic where it's easy to see what the impacts are. The existing monitors, even if you had them set up for this rule or the refinery rule, would not be exactly what's needed for the Sakmi Han rule. And the analysis will need to be very site specific. But the heart of these related rules is definitely in the monitoring, how that's done. And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Brandon. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. Sorry, we're having some technical difficulties here, uh, trying to unmute and mute ourselves. Uh, thank you all again for joining. I'm going to pick up where Robin kind of left off, and we're going to go into the sampling, and this is the how. This is what it's going to look like in your facility. Picking up from where Robin left off with maybe modifying your, your fence line might not meet the, the monitoring criteria with these components. Uh, uh, entering this this rule, you might want to look at your intermediate points and your sources closest to your perimeter, your fence line boundary. You know, anything less than 50 meters, you might need to implement an, an intermediate uh, monitoring station or shelter. So we're going to go back over the triggering chemicals. It's not an error. I know y'all seen the slide again, but I just wanted to kind of reiterate uh, the chemicals and see what we're going to do going in forward with the, the different methods that these components will be analyzed at. All right, jumping right into method 325A. Um, you can see that these components listed are going to be used uh, with this method 325A. Uh, a minimum of shel 12 shelters placed, evenly placed along the, your perimeter. And you might wonder what a shelter is. Well, if you look at the top right-hand corner, <laughs> there's a pretty little pictures of what these monitoring stations or shelters uh, look like. Um, 
let me back up a little bit. You know, I joined AIR several years ago, and it's been a while. And when I first got into AIR, I realized two things, the acronyms, and then, you know, the multiple words used to describe the same thing. I'm going to try to, you know, keep y'all sanity by uh, keeping one description of this. But if I go into monitoring stations, sorbent tube, shelters, or just shelters, know that I'm talking about the same thing. And with that, I'll keep on going. Uh, so these are going to be placed evenly spaced along your perimeter, a minimum of 12. Intermediate shelters may need to be deployed with sources less than 50 meters away from that perimeter. The shelters are going to house these stainless steel sorbent tubes. These st stainless steel, oh, that's a lot of S's, stainless steel sorbent tubes are have an active charcoal inside of them and then they're capped off with this diffusion cap it's a simple screen to keep insects bugs out and try to keep moisture out of them as well the sorbent tubes will be collected and deployed on a 14 day rotation give or take minus or plus a day uh, epa allows plus or minus a day for any unforeseen events that may happen weather hurricanes um we have a, a little wiggle room there. So it's not on that day exactly. So 13, 15 days. Uh, then the, once the sorbent tubes are collected, they will be sent off to the lab with the chain of custody. And this is for the gonna be for the analysis. So you might be wondering, what is method 325A and what is method 325B? Well, it's simple, simple as this. The 325A is the field component. This is the what Providence does. We are going to help shelter uh, determine, determine your shelter locations along your fence line. We are going to install uh, the, the shelters. We're going to collect and deploy the samples on a um, collect and deploy the samples bi-weekly. The 325B is the lab component. This is everything the lab does. The cleans and preps the samples, puts the charged charcoal in and the sorbent tubes. Um, they're the ones who are going to give you your analysis using the GCMS. Moving into 327. Now, this is going to be the most labor-intensive one. Um, you can see the two components that this falls into this method, ethylene oxide and vinyl chloride. And method 327 is simply, if you're familiar with a TO15 sample, it's the same basis as that in the field. It's going to use a six liter canister that will be cleaned by the lab with a pressure of negative 30 inches of mercury. And what that's going to do is that's going to be deployed. It, they got a, several different ways that they come, either a quick connect for with a regulator, flow regulator, or flow regulator with a, a valve. So either way, they're gonna op be opened up and go for a 24 hour period. Now this 24 hour period is gonna require somebody to be on site to deploy this canister and then also come back the next day to pick it up. The proposed is to have eight canisters equally spaced around your facility um, on a five day rotation. As Robin noted before, the labs are concerned about turnaround time with this. And, you know, with having so many can canisters out sampling at the, at the same time, the rotation may get hard. So um, this is something we're definitely get, we're looking at closely. And then the canisters may be required to move. Uh, this is not going to be an easy, easy done. You can't just move one and keep them evenly spaced. So you're going to have to look at your facility as a whole if you would like to move them around. So we keep that even spacing between each uh, canister. So we, we talked about the sampling. Now we're going to move on to the analysis portion of it. <clears throat> We've already seen your concentration limits as as listed right here and this is going to be determined by these samples so we collect them we pick them up we send them to the labs you get these numbers back 
you're you're going to be not going by your highest number or your lowest number for these concentrations. It's going to be a rolling average. It's going to be your delta C. Your delta C is simply your highest reading from this sample period subtracted by your lowest reading for that sample period. And therefore, you get your rolling delta C in micrograms per cubic meter. So your next step, say you're you in the sample period, you went over your limit. You know, you got 10 micrograms per cubic meter of uh, benzene. What's going to happen now? We're going to have to initiate the root cause and a corrective action plan. What does this look like? And initiate your root cause analysis is I, I will just give you a little background on what we've done and how we've helped facilities within five days you're going to, of exceeding, you're going to have to initiate this plan and within 45 days. This is going to be your LDAR. This is what we've done with the FLIR uh, camera to come help locate these sources. We've helped clients in multiple ways and been able to troubleshoot pretty easily, but it gets difficult because there, there's a time lapse, right? So you had your sample event, and then the turnaround time isn't always quick with the lab as you would like. So where did this source come from? Where did this hit come from? Well, if that can't be determined, then if it can't be determined, the root cause of exceedance within the 30 days, it's going to be required that you use a real-time uh, gas chromatograph to find the cause. This is a lot easier said than done. Um, we currently have a partnership with a company called InMet who manufactures these GCs. And with that, they're built as sold. So they're not sitting on a shelf just waiting for you to buy them. So what we do with this is, is we take these GCs, we implement a, a totally autonomous thing where it's all solar powered and can be mobile and moved around the facility for to help locate these sources this is going to be your proactive uh, uh, choice to, to kind of go ahead and start thinking about a gc to help with the troubleshooting if it would come if you if you delay you know there's always turnaround times for equipment and building one of these uh units on that then you want to develop your corrective action plan to address the source. This is the more you. Now, Providence has the resources to assist with this if needed. So after you get your data, and this is triggering data, this is your, your good data, everything is going to get, to get reported to the EPA on the quarterly basis. So from every, every sample period, the public will have this at their fingertips. They will post it to if you look at the bottom right corner, this is a, a screenshot of the EPA's website and what the public has at their fingertips. Okay, so thank you, Brandon and Robin. That was great information. So now we're going to open it up for questions. So if anyone has any questions, please send them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we will get to them as soon as we can. While we're waiting for a question to come in, I might add, um, built upon Brandon's last point about the public data, my experience with the power industry, which has been presenting data to EPA, who then publishes it to the public, is insightful for this industry because making the data very transparent makes it extremely easy for any intervener group to understand the details of what's going on which can open up a lot of questions to a facility. So making sure your data is correct is going to be critical to keeping your facility from um, protracted questions and answers from the public. Yeah, thank you, Rob. We did have one question from Mark and asking where we can get a copy of the presentation. This presentation will be posted to our website at providenceeng.com. 
under the resources tab. Um, if you can't find it there, please feel free. You can email Robin and I, and we can send it to you. Okay, so there's another question from Chris and it says, so all fence line monitoring for benzene is by manual collection of samples for lab analysis, no online monitoring. Chris, that's a great question. And yes, that, that that's correct. For this specific, this specific monitoring, it is gonna be all samples, all, all grab samples, if, if you will. Um, there's not any real time a part of this, but if we go back to what I said about being the proactive and using one of these mobile GCs, you will have the data at your fingertips as it's a real time monitor. Um, there's a dashboard that you can create. And if you want more information, please email me and I can get you more. Okay, we have another question from Clint. He asked, how is the annual average calculated again? Uh, I'm I'm assuming we're going to be talking about the, the your delta C for let's just call it benzene. If if that's the question, then you, you're going to get your rolling your your delta C first, right? So that's from your sample period. You're going to take your highest concentration value and subtract your your lowest concentration value, giving you your delta C. That is going to be the average ongoing per period. And okay. I'll add to that that you'll have these monitors are going out every two weeks. And so those are the values that will then be added up or put into that annual average. Yeah. Okay. We have one other question from David. He asked, do you find the boundary of your site fence line versus owned property? The Regulation, the way I read it, is differentiating between ambient air and non-ambient air. I did not see where the regulation put it in terms of dispersion modeling. In dispersion modeling, we, we deal with the physical barrier as the fence or the delineator between ambient air and non-ambient air. I think that this is one aspect that may need a little bit of clarification in the final rule, but for right now, you've um, a good default is to assume it's that physical barrier. Okay, so we're going to leave the Q and A session open for a few more questions. If you have some, just type them in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll be happy to answer. Okay, so we have another question from Chris, and it says, it sounds like upfront capital investment would be just to install these shelters. Do you have a cut sheet on what these look like and any requirements for install and approximate cost per install? Chris, uh, yeah, there is an upfront cost for these shelters. Um, we can certainly get you a, a, a a spreadsheet of what the cost was uh, or would be uh, for your facility. Um, it, it requires a little bit more in depth, uh, getting quotes from labs and, and all of that, but I would be happy to talk with you uh, further. Please email me again, Brandon Kilpatrick at ProvidenceENG.com. And uh, we can start talking about uh, costs and everything and what it's gonna look like for your facility. And if you're looking for an order of magnitude for the cost, you can you can look at the EPA values, which are probably going to be the minimum that you would be uh, required to outlay. Okay, we have another question from Richard. It says, how do you eliminate bad data? You have eight samples, 0.1, and in the middle of sample at 19. 19 is probably false. However, that would be your highest number and throw off your average. So um, how to eliminate it? There's, there's really no way to eliminate that. Um, you know, one, once you get that back, you can call it a uh, skewed, uh, skewed number or try to find the, the trigger, the, the, the trigger that, that set this off. 
Um, that's going to be your, your answer. Uh, root cause. What did this and locating that source. We, we've we had where uh, we had clients have one of their maintenance trucks went and parked right by one of their shelters and had a, a, a high hit on it. Well, they went out, I think, a couple days later and was trying to figure out what, what the, the cause of this was. And they noticed the maintenance truck parked right by the, the shelter causing the hit. Um, they reported that to the EPA. And as I understand it, everything was understood. There was ev evidence of it and it was reported along. Uh, the comments were made in that report uh, following. So the report was re revised by the lab and then and uh, added, which I added that comment in there. Okay, so we have another question from Pedro and he asked, can the analysis be done in-house if we have the instrumentation? Absolutely. Um, you, you can do this in-house. However, um, if you're not familiar with the rule and placing and shelter height um, and the requirements, you know, 50 meters or less away from your perimeter for a source and locating your sources, um, it could get a little tricky. Um, this is why we always say, you know, it's better to use a consultant, but um, it certainly if, if you have the, the knowledge and feel comfortable doing it, yeah, I, you can do it yourself. It's all uh, easily done. Just get in contact with labs. Oh, he, Pedro clarified and said he meant lab samples. If they have a lab in house. Oh, do we have a lab in house? I think he meant if he has a lab. In -house. Oh, if he has a lab in house. Um, I am unaware of anybody bringing this to my attention. So that was something I would have to uh, definitely look at. I don't believe uh, off the top of my head that that would be an issue, but I've never had that request before. So I it's certainly like a something, uh, get back to you and uh, let you know. Are there any more questions? Yeah, if anyone has any more questions, send them in the question and answer box. And again, if you have any specific questions that you think about after the fact, we have Brandon's email address as well as Robin's email address on the screen, and they'll be ha happy to guide you in your questions and provide you with more information. Okay, so we have another question from Trent. He asked, if you have a known permitted shutdown in a unit and it comes back high readings in the canisters, what sort of corrective actions would need to be done or would there need to be any corrective actions? Trent, that, that's a great question. Um, and that is something I don't know off at the top of my head. Um, this is something I would like to look into a little bit more to... Uh, make sure I'm going to tell you the correct information. So I will get your email and I will definitely shoot you an email to answer your question. Or, or if Robin, you know, off the top of your head. No, I don't. I do think that in this particular example, these are two week samples. So it would be hard to, say that the hit was due to a startup shutdown um you might have to defer to your startup shutdown maintenance plan i think that's an extremely complicated question and a good one Um, I would like to point out when um, Pedro was talking about testing them, the samples themselves, um, your in-house lab would have to be accredited. Uh, make sure that that process was applied to the in-house lab, just like we would only be able to use an accredited lab 
that we send our samples out to. Thank you for answering that, Robin. I appreciate it. Okay, guys, we're going to leave the um, question and answer session open for a few more minutes, just in case there's some last minute information or questions or clarifications that you need. And also, as a reminder, this webinar will be recorded. So if you want to reference it at a future date, you can. It's at our Providence website under resources, which is www.providenceng.com backslash resources. And if you've registered for the webinar, I'll go ahead and just send a link out to the recording. That way you can share it with your facility, with um, industry partners, anyone that may be interested in this information. Again, Brandon and Robin's email address is on the screen. And we'll keep the Q&A open for a few more minutes. Y'all have had very great questions. So um, I don't want to cut it short and give you guys the opportunity to ask anything that you that may be on the top of your mind. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any more questions. Again, this webinar will be recorded. We will send the link out to you. If you have any specific questions after the fact, please just email us. Um, you can email Brandon at Brandon Kilpatrick at ProvidenceENG.com or, or Robin at Robin Andrusak at ProvidenceENG.com. And of course, if you need something from me, um, anything can be emailed to marketing at ProvidenceENG.com. Again, we appreciate your time. We hope this information was helpful. And we will look forward to having another webinar soon with you guys. Thank you so much.